Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. This is the Wix online meeting number 94, right way, midway through January 2016. We've got a big meeting today, lots to talk about. In fact, it's so much to talk about, we're going to take it out of order. But we'll talk about it in the agenda. As always, these meetings are recorded for those people that aren't able to be with us right here, right now. As promised, we've got different agenda. Usually we do triage first. We're not going to do triage first today. We're going to talk about Wix 310.2 the update, where we're at, what's going on with that. Um, it's exciting. Then we'll do triage, and then we'll do a pull request review, um, and I'll let you guess which pull request that is. And at the end, we'll take any questions, comments, and um, probably talk a little bit more about 3.10.2 at that point. Um, so since I think we have a full day, we'll just roll right in. What's up with 3.10.2? Um, the DLL hijacking surface, which is basically, the DLL hijacking is the root issue that we've been dealing with since the beginning, was much, much, much larger than we initially understood early December. Um, and it was it was pretty crazy. Um, it was crazy enough to go write a whip about the whole thing and about what we needed to do to work around the surface area that was exposed to DLL hijacking and burn. Um, and that new thing is called the clean room. I'll we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, so we'll go jump over there. I want to point out real quick, before we go dig into that whip and get lost in there for a bit, um, there are some breaking changes in this build. Um, they're not big, hopefully. They're hopefully not in common areas, and hopefully they're not horrible for people to fix, but it is a big deal. Um, and the build, assuming everything goes smoothly during this meeting and everybody agrees, the build will be available later today, and we will discuss when we go about releasing that um, builds generally um, after we do um, the pull request review. So let's go jump over to the WIP that's written. This WIP is pretty high level. Um, I'm sure I have the latest one. Um, fundamentally, we're talking about security vulnerability. This is the first security vulnerability that I know of that we've had in Burn ever. Um, and it turns out it affects pretty much every Buddy that does installation um, with an executable. So you name it, pretty much everything, unless you ship a naked MSI, which doesn't really work well over the internet. So um, the user story is pretty simple. They want to make sure that their bundles will execute securely, no vulnerabilities. To do that, there's a number of things we need to do that stack on top of each other that in the end give us um, a full, complete, safe place to land. Um, I would take a moment to say we did work with uh, Microsoft um, at FireGiant. We did a lot of work with Microsoft MSRC, and they have issued a patch on Tuesday for one, at least we believe, one of the issues. We haven't had a chance to verify with them exactly what went on. Apparently, the Microsoft Blue Hat conference is right now, which sucks up all the security people at one time. So now is a today, this week is a horrible week to have a security vulnerability go out. But anyway, we haven't touched base with them. We're going to again. Um, hopefully, maybe today or early next week, as soon as we can get back to them, figure out exactly what their fix did. Um, our assumption at FireGiant was that we need to try to protect um, the burn from machines that may not have the security fix. Since the security fix is brand new, if we could do something in burn, anything that we can do in burn within reasonable limits, we should attempt to do that to provide a safe and secure place. So that's what this is at the clean room. So let's go ahead and start at the top. Um, what we need to do, one, uh, randomize the working folder. Uh, this alone doesn't do much, but today the working folder has the bundle ID in it. That makes it easy to guess where DLLs might show up. If we randomize the working folder, um, it makes it that much harder for attackers to ever guess. Uh, this is just a building block we build on later. The next thing we need to do is delay load, DLL, um, delay load all of our dependencies that are possible. So there are a bunch of DLLs that will go loaded by Windows, like kernel 32 that we use. That's loaded by Windows. It's loaded before anything. It cannot be DLL hijacked, as far as we know. But that would definitely be a Windows problem. But other things like cabinet DLL, MSI DLL, WinNet, WinInet.dll, a bunch of other DLLs that are things that Burn uses, we need to delay load them such that we can do some work to protect ourselves before those DLLs get loaded. Of course, what DLL hijacking does is attempts to put one of these DLLs, like a cabinet DLL, in a location where burn would load it by default, like next to burn, wherever it's running from, like maybe the downloads folder. Um, the user then 
or when they launch burn, burn will go, oh, I need cabinet DLL, and the default loader of Windows will go, oh, there's one right next to burn, use that. And of course, that code could have who knows what in it, but it is unlikely to be the cabinet DLL we want. So what we have to do is delay loads so that we don't load any of those as soon as the executable, as soon as burn starts, aka so that we have a little bit of time to write, uh, run some of our own code. In that code, we need to call set default DLL directories. That will allow us to remove the application folder and current working folder from the search order, which basically says we'll now load our dependencies only from system 32 and any other dependencies we need to load, we will load explicitly with full paths to them. We're actually really good about this in Wix, using full paths to where we're loading. I was, throughout this uh, bug fix, I've been um, routinely frustrated with the amount of work that we did in Burn to protect it from this sort of vulnerability, only to get hit <laughs> by it by Windows. <laughs> um, so the problem with set default DLL directories, while it is awesome and solves the problem in many different ways, it is only available in Windows 8 and a patch that was shipped to Vista and Windows 7. Um, as it's called out in the considerations lower, that patch went out in mid-2011, so it should be out there generally. So if we can use it, we're going to use set default DLL directories. If we can't use set default DLL directories, which basically comes down to just Windows XP, we're going to attempt to load the, the DLLs that we want explicitly from the system folder. So we're going to go and say, we need cabinet DLL, go load it from system folder. We need MSI DLL, go load it from system folder. We need WinINet DLL, go load it from system folder. By loading it explicitly from system folder, we, are not, we will not accidentally load it from whatever may be present earlier in our search path. Um, this is challenging because you have to go find all of the DLLs and that you need to load um, that are not part that are not loaded immediately by your process by or loaded by Windows like kernel 32. So you do a bunch of uh, runs on Windows XP and you hope you get all of them. And it's also interesting in that you not only have to get all of them, but you have to load them in the right order. If you load them in the wrong order, you'll still end up with the wrong things loaded because one of their dependencies will get loaded and you're back to bad space. Um, We've done a lot of testing at Fire Giant, and we think we have this list correctly. But we're only going to run this code where the default DLL directories does not work, because set default DLL directories works great. Um, and it's basically only going to work on XP. Um, the reason that we're willing to do this for XP is, one, we still say XP is a supported platform in Burn. So if we didn't do anything, we would basically say XP is a supported platform, but it's insecure which is kind of not useful to people. Um, so we're going to do XP. The other nice thing, nice thing, the definition of nice, is that XP doesn't get updates anymore, at least no major updates, certainly nothing that we know of, which means that it is unlikely that Windows XP's um, DLL dependencies will change due to a service pack in the future or whatever, which means that we should be able to come up with a static list of files to load um, and get into a good space. So, yay, there's our solution for Windows XP. It's not great, but it does seem to work. The next thing, and this is where the bulk of the effort at FireGine has been over the last couple weeks, um, took us quite a while to get to a space where we actually came up with something that would work that was reasonable. Um, and we call it the clean room. The clean room is a play off of what Burn does when it launches the elevated engine. Those of you that are deeply familiar with Burn understand that we take the, any attached containers off and we put the, only the engine, which is the stub and the BA, um, and we rip that out and ship that into very secure places and move it such that when we put it in the package cache, we don't cache however large your bundle was, we only cache whatever is necessary for the bundle to be uninstalled um, or to launch repair and things like that. Um, so we took that ability to run just the engine and we said, we'll create a clean room. So we'll create a directory where we will, if you launch burn from an insecure place, which is basically not the package cache, we will always rip the engine off, so we would take the attached container, put it into a clean folder in a randomized working folder, so it can't be guessed um, a priori. We will then, the currently running burn will then launch that burn, and that burn will then become the one that loads the BA and all that kind of stuff. This is important because the BA DLL may have untold number of dependencies that the engine does not have. For example, a whole lot of UI stuff it could do. And we can't, on Windows XP, come up with that explicit list because it's differ. 
it differs for every bundle. So instead, we put them in a clean directory, which cannot, unless some other gigantic attacking surface, you know, sources on your machine, but you certainly can't guess where this folder will be. We put the engine in there. It will have no other files next to it, which means that it can now load DLLs safely without having to worry about them being in the attack vector. Um, so that's pretty cool. The net effect of this is that when you launch burn, um, like when you do an initial install, where in the past you would, when you did elevation, if you elevate it, you would see a second process get started, which was the elevated guy. Well, now instead what you see is you'll see the burn start. You will then see it immediately start another process, which will be the clean room bundle. That will load your BA. And then after that, when you elevate, there will be a third process. So you can actually get, in very common cases, you will now have three burns running instead of two. Um, that one in the middle is the guy running the clean room. So that's what the clean room is. The last thing is um, kind of uh, sad. Uh, we try a lot of different things, but it does appear that if you name your bundle setup.exe, that you will get an app compat shim shoved into your um, process, and Windows will use the default uh, search path to in load a number of other DLLs, such as version DLL, into your process. Um, I think they also load Win9 at DLL. I don't remember the exact list, but they load a few of them. And of course, that app compat shim reopens <laughs> burn to being attacked should you name your bundle setup.exe. So there was a change to the Wix tool set to now error should you attempt to um, name your bundle setup.exe, which I expect is probably the largest set of breaking changes here. The things to consider in all of this is uh, Windows 7 and Windows Vista are vulnerable if they're not patched since 2011. That's troublesome. Um, but if they're not patched and they're on a maintained line, Microsoft still op um, supports those operating systems, they should probably be maintained. Um, another thing that's interesting, if a BA is using a git module file name for the current process, that BA will now get the path in the clean room, not the path where the bundle was running. I don't, we kind of sat and thought about it for a while, going, what would a BA be doing? It might be looking like for a text file that's next to the bundle or something like that. So we've created a new variable called Wix bundle source process path, which is set in the clean room um, and will then be set. So if your bundle's running in the clean room and you want to go get a path from a, a file from wherever the bundle actually lives on disk, you can go and ask for Wix bundle source process path and get it. Wix bundle source process path also ends up being a uh, a nice way of telling whether you're running in clean room or not. So another uh, random note, um, set the default DLL directories should have been enough. We should not have needed to implement the clean room. Unfortunately, we found that the CLR is done with doing something when they load their system DLLs that they bypass whatever is set in um, uh, set default DLL directories. Um, and so they are always vulnerable, um, even though we called set default DLL directories. And the only way we found to be safe was to create the clean room. Therefore, we always are using the clean room. We thought about doing something complicated to say, if your managed BA, um, if your BA is not managed, then, and it's native only, then, and we're not running on XP, or more importantly, the set default DLL directories worked, then we could bypass the clean room and stick the two processes. In the end, we thought that that just added a lot of testing complexity to the world. And honestly, clean room doesn't take that, um, doesn't add that much um, performance issues um, because it's really small, it's pretty fast. And so we decided that we're just gonna do clean room all the time because it made things much, much cleaner. So there's the magic of it. Um, I think. There's been a few questions, Bob, I think caught all of them, but just uh, to get them recorded. Um, do variants of setup.exe like many setup get um, shimmed? And the answer is no. We actually tried a bunch of these, foo setup and setup x and all kinds of different things. If you don't name it setup.exe, it does not get shimmed. Um, there may be other things. Uh, we were hypothesizing that um, maybe in other languages, there's a very common you know, equivalent to setup.exe. I had this 
weird thought in my head that it was called like install r.exe in German or something like that. But we didn't find anything, at least not on the English systems we tested on. So there may be other um, executables that we should block or that we should that we should block people from using. Uh, if we find those, we can add them. Fortunately, that's in the Wix toolset, not in Burn, so it's a little bit easier for us to ship a fix to that. Um, the next question was, uh, so if there's a setup anywhere in the XC, do we, no, so no, I got that. Um, is there anything we can do to manifest to prevent shimming? So we went through the manifest a lot, and actually we would love it if Windows had a way of saying, um, please load my process with set default DLL directory on by default and do all the smart stuff and have the CLR work, which would basically remove our need to do clean room everywhere. We haven't found anything. Um, it's one of the things that we'd like to talk to MSRC now that they hopefully will talk about what fix they actually did do. It's one of the things that we want to talk to them about exactly uh, what can we do. But the fundamental truth comes down to there's still XP and we're pretty confident that they're not going to ship a fix to Windows XP. So the clean room still gets us a good place um, in, you know, there. So uh, after Rob, many, one many point, Yes. Well, one point on your consideration number one. Yes. Uh, that patch shipped in the latest service packs for both Vista and Windows 7. Oh, so great. you're... you're you're not you're, you're not only unmaintained, you are unsupported. Yeah. Okay. At this point. Okay. RTMs are are cool. and just SP1 are are cool. end of life. So we should get this. We'll get this updated so it says that. Um, so yeah, let's do that. Um, we think Microsoft could provide a list of the magic. Yeah. So again, Jacob, we we need to talk to MSRC about this um, in more detail. They were they weren't extremely forthcoming about what fix they were doing before the fix was available, which I guess is fairly standard process. But now that we're here, we're hoping we can have a more open dialogue with them now. And honestly, I think they've been busy for Blue Hat. Again, this didn't seem like great timing for them, for us. So we're going to go have more about this. But at this point, um, we're pretty confident that Burn is uh, will again be safe um, going forward. Clean room's the big hammer. Clean room is the big hammer that does is it's kind of our silver bullet on this whole problem. Bullet, hammer, whatever. <sighs> yeah. So that's what's coming in three ten two. Um as you can see there's some interesting stuff. I'm hoping that you guys on the bench here will um be able to get this build, drop it into your build processes and try it out relatively quickly. Um, I know John is usually really good about signing up his company to do such a thing, so hopefully we'll get this out. He'll be able to get see the mail that comes out on this and try this. So um, hopefully we can get some feedback early next week. You know, today would be awesome. Actually, I'm hoping we get no feedback other than I don't know. Seems to work, um, and then we can get this out there. So we'll get this build out today, and then we'll get some feedback. Uh, we've done quite a bit of testing on a lot of different operating systems ourselves, and everything seems good. So the, we're expecting that the failures at this point will be in the um, breaking changes that are in this process. We're hoping that that's the worst of it. So, so other than set up that XE, the only real potential for breaking change is someone using get module. Right, get module oh, file name. Correct. So, all right, that's great. So, to summarize, the breaking changes is one: the Wix toolset will fail if you attempt to output setup.exe. Um, if you still want to output setup.exe, you can write the additional build logic to build output to foo.exe and rename to setup.exe and ship to your customers in the insecure mode. But in the Wix toolset, we're not going to spit out something that will do that. Uh, we actually consider doing a warning, but the warning is easy to ignore or miss, and that seemed really bad. So we made it breaking. Honestly, it makes everything safer. Um, the second breaking change is that your BA is no longer loaded by the process that the user double-clicked on. So you will not be running from your DVD or from the downloads folder or from the network share like you might have been used to should the user have launched it from any one of those places. You will now be running out of the clean room in a temp folder that is generated at that time with nothing else around you. So if you need files that are somehow may or may not be next to your 
um, your original bundle, you'll need to change to use the Wix bundle source path, um, source process path variable to go out and get the files instead of doing get um, something like that. Jake is asking, what about custom action DLLs? Are those going to be exploitable? No. So the DLL hijacking require basically says that you are loading from a default path based on where your executable is. Custom action DLLs are running inside MSI exec, which runs inside system folder, which means its executing path is system folder, so it's all safe. The root issue here is that burn can easily be, well, is, downloads your download folder, and you launched it. And you may have other stuff inside your download folder, and there's this concept of called drive-by downloads, which can actually get files into your download folder, albeit temporarily or until you tell the browser to stop. Um, automatically, which means you could accidentally browse to a, uh, a website that gets a attack DLL into your downloads folder and just sits there waiting to attack um, any of these installation actions. Now, Actually, what about a, just the uh, cache, the you know, browser cache? Uh, well, if it depends the, on the browser. It depends on the browser. Yeah, I think of IE, because IE will let you run the XE directly, and it's going to run it from its cache. Right, and a lot of the modern browsers, new IE, new Chromes, actually download automatically to your download folder, not to the cache. So they go to the cache, and they bring it right into the, the final location of the download folder. It's not in the yeah. in the okay. what is known as the IE cache, the browser cache. Yeah. They don't put them there anymore. They put them where they're going to download them to, which means you can get bad things attacking. So that's kind of attack. Now, one of the advantages Burn has, and it's a minor advantage over a lot of these other installation technologies that ship as executables, is Burn doesn't elevate right off the bat, which it mean at least for Burn, unless you've done unless you've hacked the process to force elevate, which I've seen some people trying to figure out how to do on Stack Overflow. But if you haven't hacked the Burn process, the when Burn starts, it doesn't start elevated, which means that attack uh, DLL does not immediately get admin privileges, where if you get into some other installation engine that does elevate right away, well, then you're owned. You're like, you're completely owned at that point, because that DLL just loaded and ran as admin and can do anything to your machine. So it's game over right off the bat. It is far more complex. Theoretically, we, we, we think you could still, by getting into the burn process, at that, in, even in the unelevated one, maybe work your way through to DLL hijack the elevated guy, but you'd have to do a lot of work. Um, so anyway, the fundamental truth is we have to prevent this entry point uh, to prevent any other exploits. And honestly, anybody running code on your machine, whether you elevate right away or not, is dangerous because they'll just attempt to use, all right, now I've got code running, now I'll go use another exploit that I can find on your machine to get elevator privileges. So in the end, we have to not be a vector for getting arbitrary code running on your machine without you you know, knowing. And of course, the nasty thing about the LL hijacking is it does not modify the running executable, which means your UAC prompt, your signature verification, all that stuff is still going to be green and happy, except you're loading in a malicious pro um, uh, code into your process. So DLL hijacking is really, really nasty. Um, honestly, Bob and I are still a little floored um, that we've been I mean, DLL hijacking has been known for, for you know, since 2010 and I, earlier, a long time, a long, 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 long time. And so we're just kind of sitting here going, how has this just been sitting here for so long? So um, it's kind of spreading like wildfire around. Um, I will have a much deeper breakdown of all of this stuff. I, I've, I've committed to writing a blog post or series on all of this and what we did in Burn um, and all the details of it. Although when we go through the code review, this video is probably going to turn into a reasonable run of it too if you're willing to sit for for the hour that this probably will turn into. <laughs> so um, net net there's some breaking changes. The build will be available later today. Please try it. Let us know if you hit anything that isn't one of these known breaking changes kinds of things. If you hit anything odd. Um, and then from there we we'll we'll talk about how we want to go about releasing this um, after we do a few a bit more reviews. All right. Enough of the fun stuff. On to the other fun stuff. Um, triage. Bob, you ready to go through our whatever however many bugs we have this week and clean oh, yeah, that but up? It's kind of anticlimactic now. No, yeah. Well, it's okay. <laughs> one of the issues in here is the one we just talked about. So, um, Addy mime type under website not working. Okay. So Wix 3.10 issue. All right. 
Yeah, probably something to go fix in 3X, right? In the custom actions. Quite possibly. I'm going to ask for... Uh, Maybe a snippet uh, to show what they're trying logs to do. Logs and, and a snippet, yep. Yeah. It doesn't work under a website element, but it does under a virtual dir. Yeah, that's probably probably some random oversight. It's possible. Um, wrong VC redist version. This is already closed. All right, this looks like a user error. Great, they're expecting to use some sort of variable that doesn't exist. Cool. Wix 4x VS 20 and win tent run to compile error. Wow. There's a lot of information missing from this issue. Yeah. Uh, um, all right, we'll leave this open for another week, and we'll come back to it. This needs a lot more information. <laughs> um, I don't know. Do we want to mark that as a triage label, or do we just want to let it sit here quietly? Um, I'm thinking the triage label is when there's been activity. All right, so we'll wait. Error during installation. During insta as an administrator, I get this. Oh, well, error writing to Torch. Oh, whoa! They can't write to a file on disk. Yeah, this is is, is it's with seven Windows Seven Enterprise, and I seem to recall we've had issues before with Enterprise Edition, and no real resolution. System error zero is kind of annoying. That's, yeah, success. Um, so this is in the, they're looking at the event log, I guess, here. It'd be good to see the, yeah, we need to see the MSI log file for this. Let's see if we get, I wonder if we get any better information out of the uh, MSI log file for this instead of this, just the uh, event. Because this is basically telling us, hey, look, the installer failed. Yeah. Um, yeah, possibly. Or there might be some ancillary data lurking in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, IV software is a good idea. Yeah. All right. But, yeah, need more information to go anywhere with that. Cannot successfully escape install command variables. Yeah, this is fun. This is awesome. I think Bob, Sean, and I all had to work our way to this. Yeah. This guy really wanted to be able to put a backslash quote on the end of something and not have it escape his string. So anyway, I think this is taken care of when we finally laid this all out. So this is closed. It did not get reopened. So I think that's all done. So we can go give it a label of, I don't know, external? I don't know, whatever you want to call it. I've been, oh, do we have external? I've been I using not a bug. Yeah, okay. That's probably fine too. Yeah, it's not a bug. It's it's the behavior. Loose file support and burn. We have MSIs that contain loose files. Fine. The loose files need to be modified after the MSIs are created. That's not going to work out well. Burn fails, yes, because right. they've been modified. Yep. But you might want to take a peek at that message because someone said it was. It should work. Who said it should work? Well, you should take a look at the mail. I don't want to get anyone in trouble. <sighs> Me? Yeah, it was you. Oh. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah, so I lied. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's not true anymore. Was it ever true? Um, it probably wasn't. I, I no, I don't see how it could be. I don't know how burn. I no, you, you need to update burn. And no. Uh, their previous app created by Install Shield supported this use case. How do you support this use case? You and, don't hash. Well, then how do you know that you got the right file? You don't know you got the right file, so you install <laughs> whatever you find there. Well, this was just. Do they? Sorry, was this just burn, or was this loose files for MSI? It's for an MSI. Oh, yeah. Well, After it's the both. MSIs are created, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how you do this securely. How do you modify a file? Like that's basically like, all right, cool. Yeah, we'll let you modify the file. So an attacker will modify the file and change it to attack your machine. 
Well, it isn't. Sorry, it could be loose and then bundled, so it's not necessarily loose on media. No, because they're modifying it after. Well, I, I, but no, because if they did that, oh, it, it would have been fine in burn. Yeah. So if they modify the files before burn is created, they'll be fine. Well, fine. Fine. I mean, as long as MSI can handle it. But I don't know how we can distribute it through the internet and to a place to get it working. All right. Well, it's 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 probably media. Yeah. So yeah, we can't do that and that. Yeah. All right. I can respond to that one. Um, so okay. just leave it open, and if I don't get to it next week, I'll feel bad. But whatever. That'll work. I won't get to it. Unicode hyphen is not accepted as a start of an option. Have we ever accepted Unicode hyphens? Um, that's the claim in the, the last. The old comment. three nine. He, that amazes me. I don't. I can't. That would surprise me. Yeah, as far as I know, it's all always. It, it, command line parsing is a common pattern in the in the in the command line tools. Yeah, I, I don't, and it hasn't changed in forever. Well, unless something weird changed because of how you know heat is built up of extensions. Yeah, well, it's a single character, right? So I guess if someone wanted to do it, you know, all right, we, we can resolve this as meh and put it in the future. I mean, I mean, we're already checking for a slash and dash. I guess adding, you know, if someone wants to go do the work to add another character that, you know, the Unicode hyphen to avoid the copy and paste from Word documents or whatever. I mean, it's not unheard of, I suppose. It's not. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I have to see the diff, and if someone wants to go run it down, I'd just go like, eh, all right. Someone's going to run all this down. They can do it. I wonder if there's a single Unicode hyphen. I, yeah. the, the That's always the fun part is, about Unicode, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. And and, and don't forget I don't know if that's actually a hyphen or like an Outlook. Um, it'll change it to an N dash. Not an M dash, which is a different kind of dash. Yes. But an N dash. And I don't know that that's the Unicode hyphen. I don't either. So <laughs> anyway, I, the, I'm... Yeah, that's why I'm like, eh, meh, and we could put it in the future. I don't know how we resolve those. Um, what do we have? We had. What do we have? Uh, we, don't, we don't have a. We don't have a label for meh, but I want to make one now. So. Well, what do we name it? Oh, come on, guys, remind me. My brain is suspend. Suspend. So yeah, you put it out there and call it whatever. You know, if you want to go do it, go do the work. I don't know. Yeah, I, it's not. I'm awesome. mostly with Sean. Like, does anybody really do this? I've I've never seen anything except this. But not a, as long as it doesn't mess up the code horribly and it looks like yeah, okay, it's one right, more character right. you can put in there, and it's yeah. one character, okay. And you can put it in one place. Yeah, it's not that bad. Well, one place per tool. Yeah. So there we go. Meh. Um, I'll make that happen. I'm gonna skip over to the set download source real quick. Um, Oh, yeah, Bob found this, I remember. We have a couple parameters that are LPW stir instead of LPCW stir, and we should just make that so. Uh, and this is in the Bootstrapper engine, so it's in the interface, which means we should be able to make it right. And if you recompile, you'll be fine. So we can do this in 3 Yes. Yep. Yeah, there's no... Yeah, and like I said, the implementation always copies, so it's perfectly safe to pass in an LPCW stir. Okay. And if you're already passing in an LPW stir, hey, look. Nothing changed in. for you. Yeah, it's not a problem. Right. Okay, yep. Um, sounds like a good thing that we should have already had, always had this const, so. Yeah, I, I will actually assign this to myself and do it since I found it. Oh, look, I sat still long enough to actually see it changing. Yeah. All right, prevent DLL hijacking. Burn. Um, this is kind of nice. Hey, look, the whip got tied to it and the clean room implementation got tied to it. This is um, pretty cool. So, yeah, so this could go to burn. This, I think, should go in 3.10.2. Um, and you can assign this to to Fire Giant. We're going to go finish this thing. We're going to take the fight. Finish the fight? Oh, I got a Halo reference in. Man, I haven't gotten to one of those in ages. So much that I felt like I needed to call it out. That's just sad. 
Anyway, um, do you want to do three ten? Yeah, we need we need a three three ten two milestone, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, that's going to look because like it's going to look like we're retroactively blowing up three ten. I'll add that. <sighs> cool. We're good here then. All right, pull request review. So I'm, I'm going to let the bench decide. I, I tossed out that we should pull request review the clean room. Um, it's not a small diff. Um, what do you guys think on the bench about walking through it? Um, do we want to go through it quickly, high level? We've had a bunch of people review it here. Um, test beat the beat the thing to death. Um, so. Sean, Jacob, Phil, what do you guys think? You want to walk through this thing? Um, I know you guys will also look at it. You could also we could also skip it because this meeting is running plenty long, um, and we could do it later. I'm looking for ideas. Bob, too, if you guys have thoughts on, do we want to do this pull request review through all the steps, or was the high level discussion good? Uh, I'd like to at least do a high level look at the code. All right. I don't know how I to do the high level code. code. But yeah. Well, I mean, I can go yeah. fast. I guess I can go fast and say, <laughs> yeah, I've been through this code a lot. I, it's like it could be like, all right, when I mean, you're looking for this block of code, does this part that we described? This block of code does this part that we described, rather than yeah. I think calling back to the whip is fine. Okay, so so that when you guys go back and you know review this in your own exciting free time, then we can go and do that. Um, I'm also inclined that is, unless we see something at a high level that's just completely hosed, I'd like to propose that we get this thing in so we can get a build out this afternoon. Um, how it's going to work. Uh, I think you'll see it in the code. It's not that bad. <sighs> Alright, so this is going to be easier probably to look at um, each of the changes as they go along until we get to clean room, which is the bigger change. So here's the first step, which is mitigating loading DLLs from the application folder to the extent that we can. Um, this is the first attempt of files that we had. You can see cabinet DLL, FE client, MSI, UX theme version. Um, this list was not, this line on 26 was not fully vetted. Um, but there's this new function called app initialize that you can give it the set of uh, files, that uh, DLLs that you want loaded, um, and then do that. Uh, minor cleanup is a manifest as we did lots and lots of work trying to figure out the manifest would work. If we could do something in manifest and we delete comments that were just bulking up the executable. So here's this new app util in util, which does the work of basically everything you should do at the beginning of your app initialize for anything that needs to worry about being DLL hijacked and otherwise being good function. So heat, heat set information, which basically means if someone modifies your heap, you crash, that kind of stuff. Set default directories if we can. If we can't, do the set DLL directory and then do that, safely load those DLLs that we listed. Um, and that's it. Um, oh, the other thing to point out here is the change to delay load as many of our DLLs as we can. Add the new headers to install it. Thank you, Sean. Good call. Good call. And I've lost my mouse cursor, so this gets much harder. Uh, randomize the burn working folder. This turned out to not be as horrible as I feared it might be, but it was pretty simple. Um, in the past, we used to calculate the working folder by passing in the bundle ID. We no longer do that. Um, it was just commented out in this diff because we were going small before we hit the clean room work. Um, but hey, create a GUID and then make the working folder there instead of creating a folder based off of um, the uh, bundle ID. And then at the same time, UUID isn't random. A little more secure. Well, but it's not going to be guessable. Oh, uh, okay. I guess we could go and create it. The goal is that they're not going to get guessed from one machine to the next. So I don't know. All right, we could go look at creating another random generator number. Um, and then the other thing we did was rather than Bernie have this funky code where it would number the BA directories because if you launch multiple burns into the same bundle ID, it would um, create a BA directory for each of those bundles that were launched, but it would do that by creating a BA1, BA2, BA3, and stuff like that. Since the working folder is always unique, we don't have to do that. So let's just clean that up and just you just get the BA folder. Um, 
I'm going to skip here. Look, there we go. I'm going to skip to the end before we do clean room. This is the change to the Wix tool set that basically says if the output of your bundle is setup.exe, then spit out this error message that uh, Windows loads unnecessary compatibility shims into a bundle with that file name. These can be DLL hijacked, compromise your customer's computer, choose a different bundle file name. So that's that change. And then there's clean room. Um, clean room. This change here, so before it used to be possible to get the attached container from the handle that we hold on to when the engine is running. Um, since the um, bundle that will ever operate the attached container is always in the clean room without the attached container, that's never helpful. So we will always do the work, which was always possible, of going and finding the attached container attached to a different executable. So we just nuke this code, which causes us to fall through to the other code. Um, we create a clean, we now create a clean room um, folder and dot cr um, we could have used the dot be because the you know cache uh what was it cache bundle to working folder um function technically speaking when it but we, as we were debugging it got really complicated when you had a be folder and then you had an when you elevated you had another bundle in the be folder and both of them had random goods in it it was really hard to figure out what the heck uh, which one was which, so we decided it was worth it to create a dot, what we call a dot CR folder, uh, so that that will be the one that the clean room is folder in. To do that, we have extracted the code that was in bundle, or cache bundle to working folder to copy engine to working folder. And this is an internal function to caching that's used in both places. Um, so before we get to that function, uh, cache initialize is a little bit um, more interesting because we now need to be told where the source process path is. This is the bundle that was launched, the path to the bundle that was launched, and we need to store this so that we can go find the attached container. Um, and that's what this change is. We, we, we figure out if we're running from the cache, and this diff looks really bad. Uh, I don't know why they found this diff this bad, but here's where we set the source cache path source process path ah. um, and then we set the original source um, based off of that it's not been set already um, which is important because we don't want to set the original source to the clean room we want to set it to wherever the bundle is running from so that's what that code does otherwise the rest of this is just inside an if that's what the rest of that diff is um, and here in the past when we would look for the attached container or we would look for files, we would look for them next to the current process, which of course in the clean rooms case is never where the files are. They are next to the source process folder. So that's what we go ahead and look for them now. So instead of looking for path to current process, we look for them next to source process folder. No big deal. Um, and then we have cache bundle to clean room, which gets the current process, figures out what the executable name is, basically the same as the currently running executable. And then we call that helper function copy engine to working folder to do all the copying. And then here's cache bundle to working directory, which is really the engine um, being copied. And all of this code that got deleted was moved to this function. So that's essentially all that happened here. All that code got lifted and shifted off to copy uh, to engine to working folder. Um, uh, when we clean the folder, we were doing complicated workarounds to try and delete only a certain number of folders and like only delete the bundle working folder and the BA and stuff like that. We simplified all this code so that we didn't have to go delete the bundle working folder, delete the cleanup folder and all that kind of stuff. We now just say, just delete everything in the working folder. Because now that we create them, there's no sharing between bundles anymore. You know, we don't have you can't run two of the same bundle and have a BA1 and a BA2 and all that kind of stuff. All that complicated um, complication is gone because we always generate a unique working folder. Yeah, made life simpler. And here's the code that was copied from above. Um, yeah, and then, oh, now the header file changes. Um, the For that. All right, so container.cpp had to change slightly. Um, the attached container, this, believe it or not, actually fixed another bug that we got reported to 
Vern Wall that we got reported to Fire Giant. One of our customers reported this issue at the same time we were working on this code. It was really kind of spooky. Um, the root issue here was that before we would always get the um, name of the container from the uh, manifest. And for attached containers, um, the binder would put the name of the executable that was being output as the name of the attached container, which is a reasonable guess for the binder. Cause it's like, well, here's the name of the output, so the attached container is on that output, so we'll make that the name of the container. But when it's attached, it's really whatever the name of the executable is on disk, whether the user renamed it or whether the uh, developer renamed it as part of the build process before releasing. So for us to find the attached container, we need to go look for it on the name of the process not by the name of the process that came out of the build lab. So here it says, if the container is attached, um, get the file name for the current process and use that as a file name for the attached container. Otherwise, go use the file path of the container as it always was, because it's going to be detached and floating around out there somewhere. Core. Um, so here you can see we're going to get the source process path from processing the command line. So that's what we do. Um, we had really complicated, we had this complicated code around elevation, and we would do tricky things where we would attempt to, if you launched burn elevated, we would launch the um, the BA process and attempt to launch as unelevated. We actually didn't do that code anymore um, due to um, uh, lots of problems getting the unelevated code to work. Um, so, but we would do that and we create a pipe and depending on, you know, if you launch the elevated guy, the unelevated guy, then he'd come back and the unelevated one would attach to the elevated guy. It was just this complicated code that in the end wasn't really serving any purpose because we couldn't unelevate the BA anyway. Um, and we, so with adding the third process, it only made it even more complicated, especially when you took into account that the name pipes that had to come back and make sure that process is reported all the way back out. So the fix here was to stop trying to do all of that, and we had this uh, quad state for the different ways you could be elevated or unelevated when you started burn. So it's much cleaner now, but the net result here is that we needed to uh, still set the bundle elevated uh, variable at the beginning when the engine uh, started if the process was elevated. So that's what we do there. That's a long way of going around of showing you code that's going to come later. Um, the reason I brought it up now is because we set this variable right here. Um, if a source process path is um, processed from the command line args, in other words, if this bundle was told it is the clean room process, then we will set that uh, variable that we called uh, the source process path, a Wix bundle source process path, and we will also create one called Wix bundle source process folder for those people that don't want to do the string manipulation inside their BA. They can just do Wix bundle source process folder, and that will give them the root of um, burn where it really is running from. Um, and then here's original source, and there's this new mode. So this is the new mode in burn. Um, the name is what it is. It's not fantastic, but it's all right. Um, it's what we call untrusted. This is if you launch burn um, straight up without any of the command line switches that tell it that it's embedded or elevated or in clean room. Now um, it runs as untrusted. Um, and so in the case of untrusted, normal, or embedded, we need to um, update the uh, cache so that we can then um, we will then extract the BA and all that kind of stuff in any of these modes. The side effect also is that when we initialize the cache, we can tell if we're running from the cache. And so if we're running from the cache and we were, we thought we were in untrusted mode, we're not. We're going to declare that we're in normal mode, which means we don't have to do the extra copy. So if you're running from package cache, you do not get a clean room instance running because we consider the package cache secure. We'll not have malicious DLL sitting around inside it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then this is the, an easier way of saying what this complicated elevation state used to do. I mentioned there's four states now. It's much simpler. If you're running embedded or if you're running normal, you need to load the BA. So that's what that code does. That's what it always did. Um, rolling along, uh, we added code to all of the parameters that set the burn mode. Um, like here's the this command line switch is the one that sets it elevated such that it would fail if multiple um, command lines were set just to make sure that if anybody's trying to mess with the command line or getting multiple these, they don't get into some weird state um, messing with them. So we just fail outward. 
I made our debugging a little easier. Um, this side, is this the clean room? Yeah, so here's the command line switch for clean room. Um, this, of course, is a burn switch, so it's a burn dot switch. It's not a public thing that people pass. It's something we use to talk to ourselves. Um, on the end of the switch is an equals and the source pass. So basically, the untrusted guy, when he wants to launch the clean room bundle, creates the bundle and then launches him and says, hey, I was originally running over here. Please come back and get your files from this location. And I know that sounds uh, not very secure, trusting the process that launched the clean room to, hey, come back to me. But because all of the file hashing that happens to all the files later means that we can go back to any executable, treat that as an attached container, should it be able to fulfill the files, we still verify them against the manifest that is assigned the clean room thing that is still signed and all that kind of stuff. So we're still OK pulling from that. All right. So now clean room is um, the normal mode. This is where we load the BA and all that kind of good stuff. I think that's the rest of this. And then we get rid of the um, elevated handling code that was complicated before, because it's much simpler now. Just when you say you're elevated, you're elevated. Um, so here we have the new clean room switch, and we removed this unelevated une switch um, to re re reduce the confusion that stuff that doesn't work and things that we don't support, explicitly support, due to the, the way clean room works, um, that's gone. There's your variables. Um, we now have a new mode that is the untrusted. This is the one that runs in clean room. Um, so then we remove this elevation state uh, because it made things so much more complicated. We just outright removed it, and that made life much easier to go figure out what code had to get fixed. We have a new run mode, of course, to go with the new burn engine mode called run untrusted. And that's where interesting code is. Uh, the rest of this is deleting code that moved to the place where we're not. Run untrusted is um, pretty simple. Um, it gets the current process path. It calls cache the bundle to the clean room. And it allocates the command line. Um, we kept this unelevate code from another place. Should we ever try to bring it back, we want to kind of show where it would go, but it does not work right now. Um, and then we call create the process, and we wait for that process forever. So we launch the clean room, and then this guy hangs out forever, waiting around for burn to finish. So the clean room, as you can see, or sorry, the untrusted process, the whole purpose is to cache bundles a clean room, launch it, wait for it. That's all this thing does. The rest of this is deleting code. We got rid of this elevated un, uh, explicitly because this code does, would not work with the new clean room in it. Um, and it's just simplified, mostly deleting. And we found a problem. We actually found a logging problem here while we were trying to debug this that when this UI create message window failed due to something else we did, temporarily the logging was not getting pumped. So that fixed that. It's a minor bug fix along the way. Um, we brought the burn unelevated uh, command line switch here next to this pipe launch uh, parent process. Technically speaking, this code doesn't run now, but we wanted to keep it in case we ever tried to bring it back, because uh, we keep talking about trying to bring this back in the future. Um, we also updated set little string because we now had a path that is a the Wix bundle source process path is a built-in that cannot be overrode, overridden, but it's also a literal. The literal string function did not allow us to specify whether to override or not, so we made it so we could override it. Everything's false except that one place where we call it to be true. And here's the built-in um, Wix source process path, source process folder, just like all the other built-ins. Um, standard built-in handling. And then this is the point at which we, we really sat down and figured out what was going on um, on XP, and you can now see the exact set of DLLs that we need to load safely from system before anything happens um, on for XP. Um, and the order here is important, all that kind of good stuff. So this was tricky. As you can see here where FE client ends up loading Crypt32, which ends up loading MSASN1. And if you load these in the wrong order, you like if you do FE client and then this then actually FE client will load Crypt32 from the target, from the attack location, and then or from the application folder, and then you're attacked again. Ah, pain. So there's your list. And then here's the Wix bundle source process path and source process folder. Documentation. So at least we did the bit to make sure that you'll know what these things are for. That was a very high level, not being very slow about it either, but that hopefully gives you a walkthrough of what the code was. In the end, it's not bad. And honestly, 
as I reviewed a lot of this, I think it cleaned up Burn in a fair bit of places. And I want to say that I've been really happy that Burn was straightforward to fix. Uh, worth calling out that for XP, we only support the most patch for... Well, I mean, we only support XPSP3 anyway. Burn won't even launch before XPSP3, so uh, that's because of the CRT, so I don't know that we have to do anything special there. If you have, you know, Windows XPSP2, Burn just dies a horrible death. So I don't know that we have to call out any patch version of XP, Jacob. Um, or, or rather, what we support is the patch level that we think. Um, so yeah, there we go. That's the, the clean room code in a high level. Despite the extra process, despite the extra work that was necessary to create the extra work that Burn does to create the new file, it's pretty nice. It actually was not bad to put into Burn. I was pretty happy with changing the code, and it worked out pretty well. So. So I'll go back. I'll take some time today, and I'll drop in, and I'll look at creating a random number instead of a GUID, I guess, and see where we're at. I'm not terribly worried wherever that code was. I've lost it now. It's too low. It's up here higher. Anyway. Oh, previous commit. Right. Thanks, Sean. Um, um, we can clean up and can go look at that and see. I'm not sure how worried I'm about GUIDs, but being guessable. If you guess it once, you're not going to guess it again. <laughs> but anyway, cool. Bob, anybody? Yes? Everybody's sitting here. Talk them into a stupor. That's the first time I've seen this, so. Yeah, right. Uh, sure, if we want to try to send things to vendors, we can do it. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how much it's going to be different. Burns' behavior is still a lot the same of reaching into itself and all that. and The code's not going to be look much different to a static no, I, vendor. I, I think the fact that we already, you know, they're kind of coping now with two processes, I think is going to mean they're going to be okay with three. Yeah, I mean, we're we're doing the same thing we did already, which is pull the engine out and fix up this, the signature so it's still good. I don't know. Seems like it should be all right. But the best way, honestly, is for everybody to submit their own thing to the AVs. <laughs> so they get lots and lots and lots of hits of burn bundles. Do all three processes run for the whole time? Uh, well, the elevated engine runs only at the point at which you elevate it. But once you elevate it, then yes, it runs the whole time. So when the UI comes up initially, you have two processes. When you hit apply, if you need elevation, you will have three processes. That first process needs to stick around so anyone who's waiting on the install to finish actually wait. That's right. Otherwise, we would kill our parent process chain, and they would think we exited, but we didn't. Plus, yes, return the right exit code. The BA gets the chance to return the exit code. <laughs> yeah, Jacob's on. Right. <laughs> exactly. The, the clean room guy figures out the, the exit code and passes it back. In fact, if you go look at the old code, we had complicated interactions. We had interactions between when you launched elevated and then you launched that, and that thing launched the unelevated. That code is now deleted in this change. But when we did that, we actually had to do work again to figure out when we were in that mode, that's part of that, the complication of that code, to figure out who was returning the exit code and where it came from. So when the elevated guy launched the unelevated guy, he had to wait and then return the exit code from that process as his exit process. And it's just like, oh, that's all cleaner now because the elevated guy is always the last guy in the chain. So it's, it's much more straightforward. Boom. bring this back up just recording YouTube has a way of
picking a video that stays static for a long time. So, Elevated bundle will work the same way now whether it was initially elevated or not. Exactly. Elevated, whether you launch elevated or not, burn will behave the same always, which is a nice thing. Um, I will note, oh, I should probably call this out. We should probably go back to the documentation and add it. There is one more non-ideal change. Debugging your BA now is harder <laughs> um, because of the clean room. We should we need to call that out. You need to cut. You have to connect to a child process, not the. So the process that you debug will not be the one that loads your BA. It will be a child process. We need to call that out. That's a. I don't know if it's a breaking change, but it is, it's you know, if you're used to debugging your bundles, you have to debug them slightly differently now. Anything else? Mm -mm. It would be ideal for us to get this fix out as quickly as we are comfortable doing so. We'll get the build out today. Um, so we'll get the build out as quickly as possible. Um, and then um, have you guys verify. So we'll, we'll get this out today. It's the thing that we're all working on here now is to get a new Wix build out um, with this change. Um, I'd like to stick a draw a line in the sand. I was going to say stick a stake in the ground, but I don't know if that makes any sense. I'd like to draw a line in the sand and say it'd be awesome if we could post Wednesday. I don't know that you guys will have enough time to test today if we get it later this afternoon, given most of your time zones. It'll be earlier. Uh, so it would give you Monday and Tuesday to try to do the builds and install them, you know, the basic stuff that you do. Um, and then declare victory Wednesday is kind of what I'd like to try to do. Are there any thoughts on that? Plus one, minus, I mean, of course, you know, we'll see. Um, as soon as the build's out, we'll send to Wix devs. Um, we'll see if anybody's like, oh, no, I need a little bit extra time, but I'd kind of like to draw that line of sand unless people think that's too aggressive and we should wait until next Friday. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to go too far because it's out there. We need to get it going. It needs to be soon. It yeah. needs to be soon. It needs to be within a week, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure there's a huge difference between Wednesday and Friday other than it's a statement that we need to go soon. Yeah, okay. So Wednesday is aggressive, but would work for Phil. Yeah, okay. So it sounds like Wednesday sounds like a, a, a reasonable place to draw. It, 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 I hope it signals that we're pretty serious about moving this thing forward. All right, so when we release this thing on Wednesday, we have an interesting problem. Um, and, and I'm inclined to take the hard line on this. Um, but we have a bunch of insecure bundles with the Wix signature on them up on CodePlex um, and insecure code that can be built with those. So I'm inclined for us to remove all of the previous builds of Wix from CodePlex and leave only 3.10.2 visible, which is a very, very, very obvious <laughs> uh, maneuver to get everybody to move to a secure version. Um, of course, you know, it's not perfect for people that need Wix 3 or Wix 2.0 for some reason. Um, things like that. We could leave Wix 3.5 and Wix 2.0 up there since they don't have burn in them and do not have a... Yeah, this, this is really just 3.6 through 3.10.1. Right. Although it would look kind of funny. Yes, that's it is it is harsh given the breaking changes, but my concern is I, I don't know, it's like how it, it really is. It turns into how hard a line do we want to take 
on this kind of thing. And um, to make it very clear, yeah, if you're on one of these other builds, you need to move to this one. Um, the, the optimist in me, which is normally very small and very quiet, <laughs> does feel it has to point out that um, at least for Wix bundles, we think, uh, because they don't elevate immediately, that you would have to have a specially crafted attack DLL to That's do significant true. damage. To do elevated damage. Um, the, uh, you know, the other thing is there are a whole lot more attractive targets um, even again because of because of Burns elevation model, there are way more attractive, tempting targets to go after um, than to do the work necessary to target Burns specifically. That said, eventually it might you know, be a real problem. So, can you drop back if breaking cannot result be results? Well, I mean, if there's any breaking things. Oh, it break ends on your side, yeah. So you you can keep the old you know Wix that you installed. Um, if someone needs the older build system, they can build from source. Yeah, and yeah. The question is, it, it really is kind of coming down to like, how hard a line should we take, right? Um, how hard a line should we take? I'm inclined to at least start by removing the lights. Now, we could just hide them. We do not, like, I'm not saying throw them away in case, you know, we ever need, I mean, we wouldn't throw them away in case someone came to us and said, oh, I need a PDB to bug this really old ancient thing and stuff like that. You know, it's like, whatever. Um, but um, I'm thinking, you know, we might, but by removing the old, the, inst the ones that we know have this vulnerability in them, it makes a very loud, clear message. Jacob, older Wix installs won't work if you take the packages off the download server. So we always did compressed bundles for the final. Yes. For the RTMs. Yes. The RTMs. And I'm talking CodePlex, right? I'm, we're talking about relieving, removing the, the official builds from the CodePlex. They'll still and be available in many, many, many places. I'm sure. And, you know, if someone really needs it, you know, we can bring it back. And even if we get huge, you know, flashback that says, no, 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 we have to have this for good reasons, then that's something. So I, that's why I'm inclined to take the hard lines, and, and then we can back off of that, because um, it's the one way we'll know if anybody really can't do that. Um, if we really hit something that we missed, and have to do that. Move them into an, an unsecure folder. Well, there's no folders in CodePlex. I mean, we could put a note on the release page that they're um, insecure, but the, I, I'm not sure anybody's going to read that. So, Although that is something we could do. We could put a note on all of the releases that says these are going to go away within this time frame and then remove them all. Um, I don't know. Gives people a chance to archive them before, which I don't know that's a great thing either. Um, well, if you've done a release and you haven't archived the tools that you used to build it, <laughs> then you deserve it. <laughs> There's, there's a little bit to that. Yeah, I, I so think there's a whole we, lot to that actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we could change the. I think I'm just looking at Coplex now. We could change the titles. You know, put insecure in brackets up. You know, at the front of the the each mm -hmm. release name. Um, I waffle a little bit with your hard line, but I don't think it's an awful idea. My big, my only real concern is is people who use Wic, uh, Visual Studio 2008 um, because we dropped support for that in Wix 3.9. Right. So they're they're gonna they're gonna have a problem there. Um, on the other hand, there are workarounds, and you can always do 
builds from the binaries zip. So that's true. All right. Well, we don't have consensus here. We'll we'll revisit this before we do it. We have a few days to decide. Think about it, um, and we'll we'll make a call later. Anything else? Other exciting things people want to talk about? <laughs> Will there be a meeting if there's issues? If we need to call an emergency meeting Monday or Tuesday, we can do that. My hope is we'll be able to solve anything that we find through uh, Wix devs. Um, but yeah, I, you know, who knows what will happen? Um, so yeah, if we if we get stuck, we'll, we can do that. But um, it should <laughs> yeah, it's going to be figuring out. It's going to be testing. Hopefully, generally, it works, and then figuring out why your BA doesn't do the one thing it used to be able to do. Why does it get the wrong answer? So, all right, um, that's it. We're not quite an hour and a half. Hour and fifteen. Hour and a quarter, I guess that is. So, um, I think we'll call this meeting good. Um, this is exciting exciting times. Um, if you know anybody else out there that has that's using installers, you know, your friends, then and that's not just burn, but anybody that's using executable installer, they are vulnerable to this. This is not a burn specific thing. Um, the security researcher that brought this up to us is very critical of XE based installers and made it very clear of his opinion that you should just ship naked MSIs, which of course, those of us that have been using MSIs for a long time know that that's extremely challenging in this day and age, um, and not to mention that MSIs do very poorly when distributed over the internet by themselves anyway. So um, so I, I don't know how many people are doing that anymore. So anybody that you know that is ha shipping an executable of any kind, that includes just self-extracting executables that then launch something, they're all vulnerable to this problem. And so, if they elevate immediately, then all they're, bets are off. Then they're very then then the users are very uh, vulnerable to it. So if you have friends that you don't that are maybe just kind of using tools, you might bring this up to them to help them know. Just do do your good deed and make everybody aware that this is an interesting and and thing because it's gonna it is spreading quickly. It's been dormant and invisible for you know I don't know when you know these things, but it's been silent. I don't know if attackers have been using it quietly or if now they're going to be like, oh, let's try to use this now. But it's something to think about as we roll from here. So uh, I guess tell your friends to do the right thing. Um, that's what we're going to be doing from here. Um, it's one of the reasons also that at Fire Giant, we're trying to publish what we did in the clean room very clearly so if other people need to do it, they can go ahead and try to do that. Um, Jacob, that's correct. Any elevated process by any developer, although usually elevated processes are installed in a secure location, because that's generally what you're supposed to do. It's just this one is nasty because of it's the first thing people launch. They're typically signed. They will look like they're safe, but all an attacker has to do is get that DLL in there. And with the drive-by downloads that are now available with the way that browsers are working right now, um, that makes it more of a realistic threat um, when we went to MSRC, they started with the, yeah, this doesn't look like a remote, a remote execution bug, therefore we're not certain we need to fix it. And so it took us a fair bit of explanations of how this can be um, very, um, how this could be socially engineered to get people to do this in ways that we think is a bit more scary. And that's when they, uh, they took the issue a bit more seriously. And so it anyway, doesn't require much social engineering either. And it doesn't require much social engineering. So. Um, so uh, tell your friends, I guess, is basically what it comes down to. Um, and we'll, you know, we can work on that whip. And like I said, I'm going to have a, a series of blog posts that detail everything. Kind of the, I'm going to try to get the gory details of this so that when you get to the end of it, you can be an expert in exactly what happened here so that people can go about and fixing all their installers. Um, and we are going to have another, I'm hoping we have a chat with MSRC in a not too distant future to give them the full breadth of this so that they can maybe come out with even better ideas. So. Um, 
Yeah, I like the idea of manifesting to call set default VLL directories for you. Yeah, I really want to be able to put something in my manifest that says, for the love well, of God, I, I am, don't I am, be vulnerable. Exactly. This is me. And then, but they need to fix the CLR too, which we've also, by the way, we have yeah. mentioned it to CLR that they have this problem and they have confirmed that they are vulnerable to this. I don't have any answers that they're going to fix anything or that they know how to fix it, but they're aware as well. So this whole stack we're built on um, needs some fixing. I'm, I would love for us to be able to set a bit in our manifest that says, I'm one of these. I'll take, you know, I will explicitly load all my stuff correctly, and then we'd be nice and safe. That would be great. Yeah. And it needs to go to XPSP3. Um, <laughs> well, and it needs to go everywhere. Time. Yeah, and it needs to go everywhere. So anyway, the, the the cascades of things that have to happen for this to be correct or um, for this to be to work out or um, means that I still think that the clean room and everything that we've done for the last few weeks in Burn is still a good thing for us to do being responsible members of the Internet Society, basically. So yep. that's going to be where we're at on as people complain about the breaking changes as things to bring in. We're going to be like, yes, we're sorry, but to be responsible members of the Internet Society, you really should be thinking about this problem. So we're sorry you're broken now, but it's better than the alternative. And the truth is the, break, the breaking changes are, are fairly obscure. I mean, you know, the, the idea that your BA was going to look – next to the process is, is, yeah, okay, there's some use cases there, but, you know, primarily those would be bundled, uh, BA payloads, and that's all, that's all fine. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty obscure. I, I, I don't think too many people are going to get hit by that. Yeah. Well, and the code would have to handle the case when you launch out of the package cache anyway, so the BA shouldn't yeah, true. crash when it can't find the file. Right, but right. There may be optional behavior of the, I dropped an INI file here, that does not work that you have to update to use this. Um, right, so right. That's the one thing. I'm fine with the setup that XE block as well because that's a horrible name to try to ship I software on. It's, it's legacy, so, which is why they up shimmed it. So, yeah, yeah, right. So there you go. Um, if you guys have questions, we'll be on Wix devs um, and so on and so forth. You can also find us at Fire Giant if people want to know exactly what's going on here. Um, we're rolling out this fix to our customers immediately as well. So it's not like we're, anybody's getting it sooner or later. It's as soon as we figure this thing out, here it is, and got it vetted. So anyway, it's been an exciting couple months. I'm hopefully we will have this behind us in a week, and we will be into a happier world. So I'd be fine if the future wasn't quite as exciting as this. Oh, yeah, yeah. So on that note, on that happy note, you guys have a wonderful week. We'll have this build out for you in the not too distant future and um, can start beating on it and hopefully finding no issues. So until we talk to you soon, later. <laughs>